They patrolled thousands of miles of wilderness, often by foot or by dog team. They caught smugglers and poachers, they distributed food rations to the hungry, they fought forest fires, and when they had to, they set broken bones, pulled teeth, and they even delivered babies. They were the men of the Newfoundland Ranger Force. The unit formed in 1935. It was a time of tremendous change in Newfoundland and Labrador. The commission of government had taken office one year earlier, and one of its major goals was to provide better social services to the people. It was a formidable task. Most of the colony's 300,000 people lived in small and isolated communities. These places were scattered across the coastline. They were hard to reach, and they were almost entirely cut off from the central government in St. John's. The newly formed Commission of Government decided to change that by creating a Newfoundland Ranger Force. Its men would patrol all parts of the colony, except for its most urban areas. The Avalon Peninsula, Cornerbrook, and Grand Falls. These places fell under the jurisdiction of the Newfoundland Constabulary. Everywhere else became the domain of the Newfoundland Rangers. They would serve as a link between the government in St. John's and the people in the outports. Recruiting began in the summer of 1935. Enlistment requirements were strict. Trainees had to be physically fit between the ages of 21 and 28 and stand at least 5 feet 9 inches high. They also had to have a grade 11 education. It was a requirement that excluded many people in the colony. There was one more requirement. All new recruits had to be single men. Any ranger who wanted to get married had to ask his superiors for permission, and that was usually granted only after he had served for five years. Marriage without permission could get a ranger kicked off the force. After three months of training, recruits went to their assigned postings. The number of detachments steadily grew over the years, from 19 in 1935 to 40 in 1939 and 46 in 1949. Importantly, several detachments opened in Labrador, an area that had been largely ignored by previous governments. Many of the detachments were staffed by a single ranger. Each man had to patrol a large territory but the force's shoestring budget forced him to use the most inexpensive means. That usually meant traveling by foot, dog sled, or boat. The ranger force had a few motorcycles and cars, but these were generally restricted to the more populated centers at Deer Lake, Badger, and along the Buren Peninsula. In the first six months of 1944, Ranger Francis Hannon covered 1,122 miles on his patrols around the Flowers Cove detachment. He reported traveling 95 miles on foot, 390 miles by boat, and 637 miles by dog team. It was a similar story in the other detachments. Far from their superiors and colleagues, the rangers had to be prepared for anything. To name just a few of their tasks, they served as game wardens for the Department of Natural Resources, investigated crimes for the Justice Department, issued government relief for the Health Department, registered firearms for the Defense Department, investigated smuggling operations for the Customs Department, and they even reported on canoe and hiking trails for the Department of Tourism. Some of the duties were straightforward, but others were more complex. Deciding who got food rations during the Great Depression put many of the rangers in a difficult position. Unlike the government in St. John's, the rangers had first-hand knowledge of the poverty afflicting outport communities. Many of the men issued higher relief payments than the government authorized. One of them was John Brown in St. Anthony. He recorded his experiences in his diary. Thursday, January 23, 1936. Received a telegram from the Department of Public Health and Welfare. Quote, Government cannot carry on relief as extensively as you report. Relieve only extreme cases. You will be held responsible. 
I replied, Appalling destitution all along the coast. Compliance with your orders would create disturbance. We'll resign before doing so. The government refused Brown's threat to resign, and he continued to issue relief. All of the rangers filed monthly reports about their detachments. Their writings cover a wide range of topics, which today give us a valuable window into Newfoundland and Labrador society of the 1930s and 1940s. We get a glimpse of the important issues facing people in the different communities, and of what daily life was like. Ranger S. M. Christian, Battle Harbor Detachment. General conditions for April 1945. During the month, most of the men have been engaged in fishery preparation work, mending nets, repairing and building boats. All of the 14 motorboats being built during the winter have now been finished and are a great asset to the local fleet of small boats. This month saw the start of bird migration, and king eider and common eider ducks have been flying north in great numbers. Many have been shot, and they have formed the chief item of diet of the local people. On the Buren Peninsula, Ranger Samuel Drover also had to be on the lookout for smugglers trying to bring in liquor from the nearby French island of St. Pierre. General conditions for December 1944. After a very quiet summer during which members of this detachment were busy investigating and cleaning up on outstanding smuggling cases, the diehards, as was expected, made a dash for the French territory and came back with their liquor. Their success was short-lived, and within a couple of hours they were intercepted and their liquor confiscated. Sometimes the rangers had to perform emergency medical work. There weren't many doctors and nurses in rural areas, so the rangers had to fill the gap whenever possible. First aid was part of their training. Pulling teeth was a common task, so were sewing up wounds, taking hooks out of fishermen's hands, and setting broken bones in splints. Some of the men even delivered babies. That happened to Ranger Norman Crane when he was transporting a pregnant woman to Bay Largent by boat. It was a little rough at the time, and I suppose seasickness and one thing and another might have accelerated the birth. Anyway, the child arrived, wanted or not. One way or another it was born, just about the time we were getting to Bay Largent. As we came round the head, I guess I was hollering for the midwife, and by the time we struck the beach she wasn't too far away. But anyway, the child survived, and the mother survived, and I survived. And that was really my only experience of being a doctor, apart from bandaging up cuts or something like that. The outbreak of World War II in 1939 gave the rangers even more work. They had to enforce blackout orders, patrol for enemy submarines, take military deserters into custody, and help recruit volunteers for service in the armed forces. After the war, the government asked rangers to secretly report on public opinion relating to political matters. Did the people want to join Canada? Did they prefer a return to responsible government? Or were they happy with the commission of government? In 1948, a small majority of Newfoundlanders and Labradorians voted to join Canada. The new provincial government decided to dismantle the Newfoundland Ranger Force and replace it with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Of the 56 Rangers on active duty when Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada, 52 joined the RCMP. The remaining four chose not to apply. Before it disbanded on July 31, 1950, a total of 204 men had served on the Newfoundland Ranger Force. <laughs>